the lapel mic on this evening, 1 Samuel chapter number 24, and uh, wow, we're going to look for a moment at the life of David. I'm going to sort of lay a foundation for the sermon tonight, and we're going to start here in 1 Samuel chapter number 24, and we think of David. David is probably maybe your favorite person in the Bible. Often uh, people look to David and we think about David killing Goliath and his life and we say, wow, his heart was uh, uh, in tune with the almighty God. And we think about David, you know, is born and David at a young age was anointed to be the eventual king of Israel by Samuel the prophet. Imagine Samuel the prophet God's man of the kingdom comes knocking at the door of David's house right there and it gets to David right there. And here David is anointed, anointed with oil to be the eventual king of Israel. By the way, if that was you being chosen by God to uh, serve him, that would be pretty exciting, wouldn't it? Boy, praise the Lord for that. Eventually, David kills Goliath and praise the Lord. Uh, God used David to kill Goliath. He had been a, a shepherd. We know the Lord is my shepherd is a, a psalm of David. And he could think back of the days, the lonely nights where he watched over those sheep. And uh, David has the, the chance to play the harp for King Saul. And eventually, after David killed Goliath, going back with Saul, the people began to sing about David. They would sing that song, Saul has killed his thousand and David his tens of thousands. And then you see a relationship built between the king's son, King Saul's uh, son, Jonathan, and David. And then eventually jealousy begins to set in on King Saul. And you get to 1 Samuel chapter number 18 and you'll find Saul for the first time, he takes a javelin. He sees David and anger, he throws that javelin at David, misses, but he tried to kill David. It's wild as you read that, David became Saul's uh, son-in-law. David married Michael, uh, Saul's daughter, and he became a, a son-in-law to the king. Eventually, through time, David begins to run for his life, and there's the uh, story of, of uh, David going to Ahimelech, and David escapes from Gath, and David goes to the cave of Adullam, and uh, Saul kills the priests of Nob, and then uh, the story of Keilah, and the men of Ziph, and the stories of David go on and on and on and on. So we get to chapter 24, 1 Samuel chapter number 24, and you're gonna notice in here that uh, David is in in Jedi, in Gedi. And if you can imagine the Dead Sea, desert land, and then a mountain goes up, and there's a, a little stream, a little, uh, little, not river, but just a teeny weeny spring that comes out of the rocks, and there's actually life around that spring. And before we go any further, Brother, uh, Brother Andy, if you'll show that little video, this was me and Joseph over there in, in Gedi, and I want you to see this, here we go. Good morning, Chesapeake Baptist Church. It's Pastor Matt over here in uh, the Holy Land by the Dead Sea, just to the north of this, was Jericho, or is Jericho, and Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, you know that. And just looking at this, back there, right there is the Dead Sea, I just say, wow, man, God is amazing. And uh, you know what I was thinking? He's given you and me life and breath. He's given us a reason to live. He's given us the Bible. He's given us salvation through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Man, it's good to live. It's good to be a Christian. It's good to serve the Lord. And uh, I hope you, along with me, we take this day that God has given us and we live for him. And uh, you just right up here, uh, they found the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Qumran. And uh, you know, those Dead Sea Scrolls, the Word of God, the Isaiah Scroll, points us to Jesus Christ. Right there in Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a, a son, they shall call his name Emmanuel. And uh, let's you and me live for Emmanuel, God with us. If you're not saved, hey, Emmanuel, Jesus is the only way, he's the way, the truth, the life, the door. Have a wonderful day, we'll see you soon. Amen. Now, right behind me was in Gedi, and as I was walking down that path right there, they had these trees, and they had these goats, and they had these goats over behind the trees on the rocks. And it's amazing as we stand right now 
and you're going to notice the goats on the rocks or the uh, goats upon the wild, uh, the wild goats upon the rocks. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to read two verses together and we'll uh, read the first verse, two verses of 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 and 2 together. Ready? And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. Okay. Now, there's going to be a foundation. We're going to turn over to the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 57, if you will. Turn over to Psalm 57. Now, as you're turning there to understand what's going on, David is running for his life. He's the son-in-law to the king, but his father-in-law is out to kill him. He's running. He's hiding. He's looking for a cave there, a cave in in En Gedi to hide from, and Saul comes to En Gedi with 3,000 men to kill David. How would you feel if you're trying to serve the Lord? You know, in the past, that God's called you to a specific work to eventually be the king, and you're just trying to do right, trying to follow the Lord, trying to, to trust in God, trying to live for Him. And next thing you know, there you are in En Gedi, hiding out in a cave with 3,000 men with Saul. They're, they're right around the corner, lurking, trying to kill you. What would your prayer be like? What would you say to God? What would you think in your mind? How would you feel? And that's where we get this Psalm chapter 57 is a Psalm of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. Look at verse number one with me. The Bible says, be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me for my soul, what? trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God, most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send uh, from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up, Selah. And Selah says, means think on this. And we think about that. He's in a bad spot, isn't he? Boy, but what is he doing? He trusts God. What is he doing? He's looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of his faith. He says, God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Verse four, my soul is among lions and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me uh, into the midst where if they are fallen themselves, Selah. Now we get to verse seven, and this is where the sermon comes from. Remember David? He's there in Gedi in a cave. He's running. He's got a lot of issues. And look, look at this verse, verse number seven, and read those first four words with me. He says, my heart is fixed. Say those four words again. My heart is fixed. And continue on. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. Why? Verse 10 says, For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Read verse 11 with me. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Sometimes we get a wrong picture that because you serve the Lord, everything's going to be perfect. You're not going to have any problems. You're not going to have any difficulties. God's called me to do, do a work. And God had called David to be eventually the king. But it didn't mean he was without problems. It didn't mean he was without persecution. It didn't mean he was without struggles. This problem was 3,000 of, of Saul's chosen men out there to kill David with that specific purpose. And what did David say? Say, say, what did David say? Yeah, that's right. Okay, what did David say? He said, my heart is fixed. That's the title of the message this evening. My heart is fixed. Let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you for the amount of people that are here tonight. They love your word. 
Thank you for 1 Samuel chapter 24. It tells us the rest of the story, how you miraculously delivered David. But help us to think about the situation and the dire situation that he was in. And Lord, when we get into that position where things don't go our way and there's problems, there's enemies, you may say, all around us, help us to be able to say, as David did, my heart is fixed. We love you. We need you in Jesus' name. Amen. As you look at this great passage of scripture, David said in, in uh, verse number seven, my heart is what? Fixed. What does that mean? My heart is fixed. And what he's saying right there is my heart is settled. He said, my heart is firm. It's fast. He's basically saying, hey, I have no plan B. God is the only one I'm living for. God is the only one I'm going to serve. God is the one I'm going to trust. And he's never left me nor forsaken me in the past, though I had troubles. And he's not going to leave me nor forsake me now. My heart is fixed. Boy, you know, sometimes in life we get tossed to and fro with life, with circumstances, with just uh, people sometimes, with our health sometimes, with our problems of life. Sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's our health. The book of Psalms chapter 109 says this. It says, I am tossed up and down as a locust. You ever seen like a fly in the wind or a bug in the air and a big gust of wind hits them and they start going and flopping and flying all over the place? And you can be tossed to and fro like a bug in this world that we live in. In Isaiah chapter 54, it says, I, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest and not comforted. And sometimes we in our life, we're tossed with the wind and we have no comfort in our circumstances of life. And that's where David was at this point in life. He's just trying to serve the Lord and he has to run from here to run to here, to run to here, to run to here, just trying to serve God. And his father-in-law is chastening him with 3,000 people trying to kill him. But you know what David said? What did he say? My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. It's not fixed on revenge. It's not fixed on money. It's not fixed on fame or your circumstance. It's not even fixed on outcome, but his heart is fixed on God. And this truth is important for you and me. What is your heart fixed on? And that's a good, good question to ask you. What is your heart fixed on? Is your heart fixed on people accepting you? Is your heart fixed on everything going right in your life? Hopefully, we can say our hearts are fixed on God. We've settled on God. We believe in God. We're going to trust in God. We're not going to look to anything else. Now, in the Bible, you, you see people that are fixed on God. We would look at Daniel fixed on God. We would see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fixed on, on God. But you also see some people who are not fixed on the Lord. In the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 4, it talks about a man named Demas, what do you think about Demas? The Bible says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And, and how did that happen to Demas? Demas was not fixed on God, not settled with God. He allowed plan B into his life. And, and you can see maybe Demas in his life had a struggle, had a difficulty, had a problem similar to David where things didn't go his way. He had troubles, he had trials, he had people who didn't treat him fairly. He had struggles with his health maybe or struggles with uh, people. And next thing you know, in life, all of a sudden he begins to think, he said, this Jesus thing's not working out. This Bible-believing Christianity is not working the way I think it ought to work. And all of a sudden he goes off of being uh, plan A, fixed on God, to going into this world, loving this present world. Do you know how easy that is to do? Amen. Well, we criticize De Demas but we need to make sure that we are fixed on God. There's another problem is being fixed on ourselves. And I'm always thinking about Isaiah chapter number 14. And it says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Uh, Satan uh, was an angel in heaven and he fell. And how did he fall? In verse number 13 of Isaiah 14, he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. What was the problem with, with Satan or Lucifer? He didn't have his heart fixed on God. He had his heart fixed on himself. 
His life was lived for me, myself, and I. By the way, when we live for ourselves, we put us first, me, myself, and I, we're gonna run into problems really quickly. We're gonna make some decisions that go against God. And the end of Satan is not good. The end of Lucifer, it says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Well, I wanna encourage you, church. Uh, it, the rest of the sermon, there's more to it than that. But, but make sure your heart's fixed on God. Don't allow yourself to have a plan B. Well, if this church thing doesn't work out, this Bible thing doesn't work out, this Christianity thing doesn't work out, here's what I'm gonna try. No, 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 no. And God always works. The Bible always true. Boy, God always comes through. We just need to make sure that our heart is fixed on God. Now, go to verse number seven because it'll sort of explain the uh, David. Well, look, look it back with me, verse seven again. My heart is fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. And in a way, he had to say it twice. And I'm not sure that he was talking himself into it, but in a way, he's like, my heart is fixed. And he's talking to himself, my heart is fixed. And sometimes we gotta make sure that we talk to ourselves in the right way and say, hey, listen, my heart's fixed. My heart is fixed. And remain fixed on the Lord. Then it says in verse number eight, wake up, my glory, Awake, sultry and harp, and I myself will awake early. And you can almost see David in that cave saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get up. I'm gonna wake myself up. I'm not gonna walk in darkness. I'm not gonna slumber nor sleep. And, and through life, have you ever met, met somebody who's there, but that's not there? I mean, you talk to them and they're there, but they're not there. It's like they, they don't get it. They don't understand and often, that's their own fault. They allow themselves to walk in darkness. They allow themselves to slumber and sleep through life. And we're not to do that, we're to wake up. And David said, hey, I'm gonna wake up. I'm gonna uh, make sure that my mind is thinking clearly. I'm gonna make sure that I'm not going to go off the path right there. I'm gonna think clearly. I'm gonna keep my mind focused on the Lord. Uh, Proverbs chapter six, verse nine. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. My son Sam, the other night, you uh, came into my office, and I have a, a little chair right there, a lazy boy chair right there, and he fell asleep in that chair, and he, you don't even remember this, but I woke you up, and I said, it's time to go to bed, Sam, time to go to bed. And I mean, his eyes opened for a second and they went like this. And so I, I grabbed him a little, I started pulling him a little bit. And so it didn't even bother him. He's just like pulled over like this. And, and then finally, uh, it did sort of wake him up. And I said, Sam, you need to walk over to your bed to go to sleep. And he's there, but he's not there. And so he sort of moved a little bit and he got about halfway out of the chair and then he got his knees on the ground and he laid his head down on the chair again and was sleeping. And so I didn't kick him. No, I didn't kick him. I punched him. I went, get up, boy. And uh, no, I didn't. And uh, anyways, I sort of drug him up again. Oh, and then his eyes, he's up there. He's like, okay. And anyways, I didn't pay attention to what happened. He went out of my office. He's going over there, he's gonna to go to sleep right there. A few minutes later, I walked out and he never made it to his bed. He fell asleep on the couch right there. But you know, it's sort of funny with an eight-year-old who will sleep like that, but it's not funny when people sleep through life. It's not funny, and a lot of times what we need to do is wake up to reality of life. Boy, somebody turns 18 and 19 years of age and they, they sometimes they just need to wake up and understand life's not a game. And uh, there's a thing be, about being sober-minded, serious-minded, doesn't mean you don't laugh, but we gotta realize that, boy, sober-minded, the, the life is serious and the choices that we make matter right there and we need to wake up. It matters if your heart is fixed. It matters if you uh, keep your heart and mind fixed on the Lord. Wake up, wake up. God matters. Our families matter. Your spouse matters. Your children matter. A right relationship with people matter. Even your enemies matter. Church matters. Souls matter. And boy, I, I remember probably eight or nine years ago, I met a man who is a banker. 
and uh, he was way, way up in the banking system, and he had really helped make the bank millions and millions and millions of dollars, and, and we were staying at the same house. There was a church conference going on, and I was staying with him, and he began to give me his testimony. He said, you know, I've got a lot of money, made a lot of money through the years, got a great job, but he said, I was just sort of sleeping through life, uh, worried and concerned about money, but never living for God. And, and then he said, you know, I had to wake up. I had to wake up. And man, I thought it was convicting staying in the same house as that man. That man later on the next morning got up at three in the morning and he began to pray. And I got up and I prayed with him at three in the morning. But you know what? He was serious about things of God. And he said, I'm going to live my life, the years that I have, and I want to be awake. I want to be awake. I want to be right with the Lord. Now look at verse number uh, seven again. Let's go back through this. Verse number seven. My heart is fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. Verse number nine. Look what it says. I will praise thee, O God. Boy, that's a good thing to do. I will what? Praise the O. Yeah, well, I got the NIV tonight, so <laughs> just kidding. The wrong verse that I'm reading from tonight. I'll praise the O Lord among the people and uh, praise the Lord. It's not an NIV, it was a mistake by me. And, uh, but I'll praise the O Lord. And you know, the circumstances are bad. The circumstances are difficult, and uh, Saul's right around the corner. You can see David sort of peeking out that cave right there, and you can see that's right there in Gedi right there. Maybe he's up there, and he peeks out, and he sees that army of 3,000. He sees the struggles and the difficulties, but he said, man, I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord. You know, you choose whether you praise the Lord or not. You choose. Boy, that cranky attitude that you, if you're not careful, that you have and you justify and say, I have a right to have a cranky attitude. No, you don't. Well, my circumstances, knock it off. Boy, it's not as bad as you think. Boy, wake up, wake up. Have a heart that's fixed on God. Have a good attitude. Don't be cranky, don't be grumpy, don't be a, a sourpuss. Boy, trust the Lord, believe in him, praise his holy name. Amen. You know, some of the, sometimes, God allows things to happen in our life. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them whom are the called according to his purpose. And some of the worst things that seem to happen in your life are actually the best things that are happening. You just don't know it. So in the midst of that, try your best to praise the Lord. By the way, how many of you like being around people that are sourpusses? How many of you like being around grumpy pants? None of us do. But how many of you like to be around somebody who praises the Lord? Boy, it's encouraging to be around people who trust and believe and praise the Almighty God. Look at this next verse, if you will. He says, I will praise the Lord. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. Then verse number 10, for thy mercy is great. Now, in that circumstance, for thy mercy is great. Does it look like it? Doesn't really look like it. I'm in a cave. Imagine he's out there, there's Saul. There's 3,000 of them right over there. And in the midst of that storm, the midst of the city, he's talking about the Lord's mercy, God treating him better than he deserves to be treated. And that's very important for, for you to realize your situations sometimes seem so bad. By the way, I fight grumpiness sometimes. I, I'm preaching to myself tonight. Boy, the other night, it was Thursday, Matthew. Your, your house has got the water leak. And uh, you don't want to talk about the water leak, but I'll talk about the water leak. It, it's been leaking over his house uh, from the street to the, to the house. He's gotten outside and there's water been flowing out of there. And it's my time to fix it. And so Thursday night after the soul winning, I got over there and, and I had to dig it out myself. And it was just pure sludge mud. And I dug it out of there. And, and then next thing you know, I got me, I figured out how many to solder me a thing. And I soldered this little joint on there, put this pipe in there. It's finally 8.50 at night. We're gonna turn that water on, turn that water on. And my joint looked good and the other one looked good. You know what happened? I didn't go far enough. I fixed the pipe, but I didn't, it was foot, the leak was a foot and a half farther. And that doesn't mean much to you, but it was late at night. And that's a hard time in those circumstances to praise the Lord. So I, I'm a mud, I'm a bunt ball mess. I had to go to a 
the, 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 the Lowe's store that night and finally we got back and got done probably at 10.30 at night. We turned it on again and guess what happened again? It was fixed. <laughs> it was fixed. So praise the Lord. But, but you know, that's life, is it not? Problems, things not going your way. And in those times, I have to fight the temptation to be grumpy, to be angry, to be upset. But God's merciful. God, in the midst of that, treats me better than I deserve to be treated. His mercy is great. And that's what it says, for thy mercy is great. Thy mercy. God treats us better than we do. You know what we deserve? We deserve to die and go to hell. We, we do. We deserve, we deserve to die and go to hell. But God, in his infinite wisdom, boy, has taken care of us and been good. Look at this next one, if you will. And I love this part. In verse number 11, it says, Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. And David, what did he want? He wanted God to be exalted. Probably my biggest problem is I'm concerned about me, myself, and I way too much. And I don't mean to be that, but that's my flesh. So almost daily I have to say to myself, knock it off, Matthew. Knock it off, Matthew. Boy, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about the Lord. Be thou exalted. Be thou exalted. Be thou exalted. Boy, the Lord deserves to be exalted, doesn't he? Boy, it's not about you. By the way, church, church is not about you. It's not about me. It's about the Lord. Your home is not about you. It's about the Lord. Boy, everything that we do this side of eternity is not about us being exalted or lifted up. It's always been about the Lord being exalted. It's the end of the sermon right here. And then think about this. Are you going through some struggles? How do your struggles compare to David's? You got your father-in-law after you? You got some in-law problems, some difficulties? They got an army of, it seems like 3,000 out to get you and kill you and saying all manner of evil against you and you're hiding in a cave? Sometimes it feels like that. But, it, but listen, Dave had, David had it really, really, really bad. How's your heart? How's your heart in the midst of your struggles? Is it fixed on God? Is it fixed on God? How about this? Are you going through life? Are you awake? Are you awake? What about this? Do you use your voice to praise the Lord? Or are you using your voice to complain about your circumstances? Are you remembering God's mercy even a difficult time? When things aren't going your way, it seems like you're in the lowest of the low, are you lifting up your forehead and saying, God, great is your mercy. Well, I trust in you. You're treating me better than I deserve to be treated. What about this? Are you exalting the Lord with your life? the end right here. God has been good to us as a church, Chesapeake Baptist Church. He's been really, really good to us. Boy, being able to have a Bible-believing church, Bible-preaching church, people getting saved, people getting baptized, and boy, people even coming to church on a Sunday night, and God doing a great work. And, and you know, in, in church work, Brother Smith, Pastor Smith over there, in church is not always a mountaintop. Well, there is definitely right around the corner a problem, a difficulty, and not a small one, but a big one. I don't know what it is, but that's just life. In your family, it's the same way. Well, you try to live for the Lord. You try to serve him with all of you got, but right around the corner, you may be on a mountaintop now, but it's not gonna be long, and you're gonna have a Saul in your life chasing you and attacking with 3,000 men. What are you gonna say? I'm, ex I I'm, I'm fixed on you, God. Fixed on you. Hey, God, I'm gonna praise your name. I'm gonna to try to uh, look at your great mercy. Boy, I'm gonna to try to exalt you in my life and in my voice. And that's what we need. My heart is fixed. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. And it's a good truth, Lord. The correlation between 1 Samuel chapter 24, where it lays out the groundwork and actually how you did move mightily in David's life during that time, and you miraculously did deliver him, and thank you, Lord, for that. And Lord, it's hard in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the difficulty, in the midst of the 3,000 people that are trying to attack you to act like David did. But I believe, Lord, you gave us that psalm to show us what to do in the midst of a storm. And I do pray there are probably several people going through a big battle right now. Some, uh, some of the people are battling with a health or a relationship 
or just their finances, Lord, and they don't understand. They've just been trying to serve you. I pray that you help them just to go to you, not worry about the future, but have their heart fixed on you. Help them to exalt you, help them to praise you, and I pray that you help them to live for you, Lord. We love you, we need you, we ask you to bless this invitation in Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me if you will.